Hi, 你们好。Welcome to my YouTube channel, Shanghai Jing. It's Zhou Yi. I'm back. Zhou is my last name. Yi, my first. Today's topic is images of Zhongguo women in the West, Part One. Where are the tales of our heroines? This episode of Shanghai Jing is about the images of Zhongguo women in the West. Zhongguo, the Middle Kingdom, is the official name of the country, known in English as China. As I have suggested in my previous episodes, it is time for us to use the official name Zhongguo of the country, and that's what I shall do. The purpose of this two-part series. Is to restore the images of Zhongguo women in the West. I shall start by shouting out, "Where are the tales of our heroines?" What sickens me is that for a century and a half, we the Zhongguo women in the West have been cast in two extreme stereotypes: either the dragon lady, evil and vicious, or as helpless and subservient to our men. It is about time these images changed. My first question is: Are Zhongguo women as submissive as Westerners have portrayed us since the mid 19th century? I haven't met one yet. Have you? Look around. Are you, your sister, your mother, or your wife, or any of your friends submissive and helpless? The fact is. Zhongguo has countless heroines in our history and legends. In all legends and historical tales, women were often the heroine who saved the men. Historically, Zhongguo men did not need to be macho to prove their manhood. They were confident enough not to be intimidated by these stories. In fact, they loved them. In Zhongguo tales, men were often portrayed. As vulnerable, sensitive, even shy. Even the heroes or the vagabonds in the Wu Xia Xiao Shu, the Kung Fu fictions, were portrayed as gentle and reserved with women, at least the good guys, and the bad ones were brutal, looking for a fight, needing to display power. This reflected our basic philosophical belief: the softest strength. Humility is merit, muscle is crude, and only the bully is aggressive and likes to show off. By comparison, in early European fairy tales, females were nearly always rescued by males, and the ultimate dream was to wait for their prince or knight in shining armor, as in Snow White and Sleeping Beauty, or for the prince to marry her. And pull her out of misery, as in Cinderella. Generally, these tales revolve around two ideas: men had to be heroes and prove their bravery and manhood. As for women, their appeal revolved around sex. What if Snow White was not white, and the fairy godmother did not dress up Cinderella and beautify her? Would they have the chance to be rescued out of their misery? And live happily ever after. Having said that, I must say that I love these fairy tales just as much as anyone else growing up. I bring these tales up to make a comparison with the damaging image the West have imposed on Zhongguo women. In Zhongguo women's history and folklore, we had many women warriors. Among European legends, one warrior that I know of is Joan of Arc. No disrespect, but she had to claim her power had come from God to become a heroine. Sadly, the legend diminished her power as a woman. It is also true that throughout the centuries in Zhongguo, Li Jiao, the rights of etiquette, severely stripped women's rights 
in the most demoralizing way. By the same token, European women did not fare any better. From the many European tales I read in earlier Western societies, where women fell from grace to prove their saintly virtue, many ended up in convents to live a gloomy, solitary life. Take Thomas Hardy's novel, The Mayor of Casterbridge. It showed clearly that husband could sell a woman as if she was his possession. The man did not even bother to give an excuse. And the women followed the new husband with no objection or resistance. And even in her later life, she showed no resentment towards the heartless first husband. This was not uncommon among the poor in the 17th to the 19th century in Britain, often as an alternative to divorce. In the Tsongkhwa old system, at least the husband must have a strong reason to divorce or rid himself of his wife. Otherwise, he could be brought to court and punished by law. I remember when the film Mulan came out. Many Tsongkhwa Americans were excited that finally a big budget American film had portrayed a courageous Tsongkhwa woman. But on the second thought, wait a minute, this is too pathetic. Are we that desperate? behaving like a beggar, having been starving for a century, that we must feel thankful for a piece of home. This made me want to reassess the Tsongkhwa women in our legends and history. Among our many legends, our first female rebel was Chang'e, who defied her husband, took the immortal pill which was meant for him and ran away to the moon. Did the people condemn her for her rebellious act? No, she was looked upon as a heroine. More than that, it was the woman who became immortal, not the man. Each year, on the 15th of the eighth month of the lunar calendar, when the moon is at its brightest, while we celebrate the Mid-Autumn Festival, savoring mooncakes, with her family and friends. We can see her there in the moon with her white bunny at her side. Take a look at the moon on the next 15th of the eighth lunar month and you will find her there. One of the most widely known folk tales by Shi Zhuang, the legend of white snake, also honors a woman. The legend is about woman's love. In the tale, the relationship between men and women is far cry from Snow White and Sleeping Beauty. White Snake was a spirit who chose the young physician Xu Xian and lured him into falling in love with her in human form and marrying her. She fought against the righteous abbot Fa Hai, who was determined to break that forbidden union between a spirit and a human. To protect her love and marriage, she divined not only on the society, but the supreme power in heaven and never budged. In the end, she was confined under Lui Feng Ta, the Lui Feng Tower, until her son grew up to rescue her. Today, if you visit Hangzhou, you will see people worshipping her at Lui Feng Tower. As for women warrior, None can surpass Liang Hongyu, who was the general of the Song Dynasty in the 12th century. She was an historical as well as legendary figure. Her birth and her real given name were lost in time. Most likely, she was born in 1102. The name Hongyu, meaning Red Jade, was the name given to honor her in folk legends. Leon's grandfather and father were both generals. During her childhood, her father was an army commander at the frontier. But in 1120, her grandfather and father were both put to death due to their failed campaign to suppress a peasant rebellion. According to some historical accounts, 
Due to her father's downfall, she was enslaved for a time and might have been trained as a woman wrestler. In the Song Dynasty, female wrestling was a popular sport, even attracted empress to public matches. Most female wrestlers were dressed as males wearing nothing but the loin cloth during the match. This sport was later considered indecent and banned during the Ming Dynasty and had been ever since. At a certain point in Liang's career, she met her husband Han Shizong, who was a military officer. Together, they embarked on the northern expedition to fight the Qin in the north. As a general, Liang Hongyu commanded in actual battles. Her most famous battle was in the year 1129. She won the battle with 8,000 men against 100,000 strong hunts of the Qing army. She won by initiating a military communication system by using the drum and flags as command signals. The drum beats told the soldiers to advance and the absence to stop and take the positions. The flags signaled the direction the enemy forces were heading. Later, her husband Han Shizhong joined Commander Yue Fei to launch their final campaign to conquer Qing and restore the Song Dynasty. But they were ordered to return to the capital. The emperor, in fear of Yue Fei's growing fame, supported the faction who favored peace by negotiating with Qing. Yue Fei was condemned to death later for the crime of Mu Xu Yu, which simply meant no factual crime is required. Han Shizhong was stripped of his commanding power. Despondent, both Han and Liang resigned from their posts and live out their lives in Hangzhou by the West Lake. Liang Hong Yu was believed to have died of illness. Of all these legends and courageous women, how many of these tales were known to the rest of the world besides the people in Zhongguo? Instead, the world was filled with portrayal of us by the West, as subservient and never fighting back. Why not give the world the positive side of our women? Why always a negative that the West had cast on us for over a hundred years? How can we young people be proud of their origins when all they see are the images of their forefathers as weak, nerdy, and secular? Which is a lie. Look at the Songwood population, hardly the result of sexlessness, and images of their foremothers are feeble and submissive, or otherwise dragon ladies. It is not time for us to rectify these negative images of our women. In my next episode, I tell you about another extraordinary woman, a 12th century poet. Until the next episode, Shanghai Jin. Thank you again for listening. Take care. Bao Zhong. And the fairy mother god did not dress up Cinderella and what what do you... <laughs> it's not it's not fairy mother god. Fairy godmother, what did I say? Fairy mother god. <laughs> <laughs>